All right, hey everybody. So um, as you know, today we're gonna to be talking about value, um, which is like a huge subject that like, you know, the more you get into it, it's like just spirals of more stuff that you can find out about it. So actually for those of you who are here, I'm curious what it is that you know about value um, or what you've understood about value. I'm just curious kind of to get a like a sense of like, do you know anything about it? Do you know nothing about it? Um, that kind of stuff. And then I can start and sure. Like dark to light shades of, or no. Yes. So that's great. So value, exactly. It's the lightness or darkness of a color. Um, it's basically shades from white all the way to black. So it's all the grays, all the what. And it sounds really simple when you think about it that way, but basically the fundamental, the, it's like the fundamental principle of anything that's visual because value is what allows you to see and recognize what it is that you're looking at and to really just start identifying stuff. Um, so irrespective of color. And usually if you have like a solid foundation in value, then you have like, like it's going to make your images more readable, more pleasing to look at. And so it's one of those things that once you start diving into it, you realize like how powerful it is to understand um, the tool of value. But again, it can get pretty complex. So I'm going to just try to break it down um, pretty simply, but let me know if ever you're kind of lost or, uh, or if there's something else that you want to like dig into. All right, cool. Cool, Wendy. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Ananda. I said cool Wendy, but I meant cool Pam. Because <laughs> I thought it was your comment, not Wendy, sorry. Um, all right. Okay, so I'm going to bring up the images of, so I hope you guys all have the photos that I sent in the post. If you haven't, I included a link in the um, in the email that I sent out 15 minutes ago. So you should be able to find them pretty easily. And I and I selected quite a few of them more than I usually do just because um, I kind of wanted to talk about some of these different principles and I thought it would be nice to have a pretty wide range of images. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you. Um, here it is. Hi, Bill. Yay, there's a good bunch of us today. Nice. And oh, 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 of course, I didn't, I didn't mention this, but as always, like, you know, I'm, I'm exploring this subject because actually I think it was Mel who suggested that we work on value and it's, you know, a fascinating subject. So I'm all for it. Um, but if you're like, screw that, I don't want to get technical. I don't want to like deal with any of this. Like, that's totally cool. You can just go on and, you know, pick something that you want to work on, even if it's just doodling or, you know, coloring or whatever, and then, um, just draw along with us. Oh, cool, Jody. Yes, okay, so that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking, um, so for those of you who don't see the chat, um, Jody was asking about if I could talk about value as it relates to contrast. And that's exactly what I'm going to get into right now. Um, because, so just as value is the difference between, or sorry, value is the lightness or darkness um of a hue of a color contrast is the thing that allows you to see so high contrast is pure white and pure black and i'm going to give you just a few examples of that in this which is here oh that's the wrong post 
I'm trying to give me a sec. Here it is. So the most basic notion, can you guys all see this? Can you see, can you see the screen with, um, with the photos, the images? Having a bit of an annoying thing with the chat today where it's not appearing when I'm sharing my screen. Ah, here it is. Okay, cool. Awesome, Jody. So the first images that I shared in this, um, in the array of images that I picked are some of these super high contrast images. And so what that means is that there's a huge difference between the lightest lights and the darkest darks. Um, and so what that means is that you can see it very clearly. And there's an example that I think is really, it really like emphasizes what, like how important and basic this is. Um, babies, when they're, you know, born and learning to see, they actually can't see a huge range of values. And so the first stuff that they see is things that have high contrast, things that are pure white in comparison to pure black. And so that's really like even just the basis of our vision of understanding and comprehending the world around us. And so that's why um, having a notion of high contrast is so important. The other thing is that when you have really high contrast like this, um, oh, actually, maybe you can let me know in the chat, what adjectives, if you had any, what adjectives would you use to describe an image like this one? I'll just give you a little moment to look at it. And I'm going to show you maybe a few more. And if you have any sort of like ideas and it's fine if you don't have anything that's fine i'll just tell you i'll just tell you but i thought it could be fun to um yes bold jody that's a great one this one's already getting into uh let me see if there's yeah okay so that's when it starts shifting so Jody, you are definitely onto something when you say bold. So high contrast, there's often this dramatic um, impression to it. And so like even this image, which is actually very minimal and kind of peaceful in that sense, because like, you know, it has like, it's like the snow in the sky and you just have these few little elements because of the fact that there's a very high contrast between the sky snow and the different elements, the tree and the little um, fence, it, it automatically brings in an element of drama. Whereas if you had an image where that was like way lower contrast, so where this would be more of a very soft gray value and this was a soft gray value, it would give you more of a sense of moodiness, of dreaminess. If you look at this, it's like automatically super dramatic. You're like, there's, it, it's like a punch. Um, maybe that's one way of putting it is like high contrast is a visual punch. And the interesting thing about that is that sharp, yes, that's a great adjective as well, Melanie. Sharp, bold, dramatic. Um, if you look at even like film noir, Often it's like there's a lot of this kind of drama. I mean, they oscillate in film noir also with like low contrast things, but there's just this, there's something very loud about it in a sense. And then when you start edging towards things that are low contrast, this is still kind of high contrast. Low contrast is when you have a bigger range. So your lightest lights and your darkest darks aren't as far away from each other as in high contrast. So what it means is you have an image with a lot of grays, a lot of medium gray tones. This is kind of an example of that, but I'm going to show you a few more. These are all kind of middle contrast, I would say. 
And here we're starting to edge really towards lower contrast, where you see like the whitest white is not pure white, it's more gray. Same thing here. And you have a bigger range of all these in-between tones. I don't know if you can, if you, if you, let me know in the, in the chat if you guys are understanding what I'm talking about here. So here, for example, the black is not a pure black. It's more of a gray. And this is actually the best image that I found. Honestly, I struggled to find more of these low contrast images. But this one is like really a perfect one to illustrate that because like the lightest lights, they're just like gray. And then the darkest darks are black, but you see the range is much tighter if you compare it to this first one. Right, I thought that was going to be like the next one. <laughs> okay, I found some more actually in the end. I'd forgotten about those. Um, so this is also a great one, but in a white version of that. So this is also a very low range of values. Um, and you can see like, also just like the really dark one, there's a moodiness to it. There's something that's kind of soft and peaceful, but also eerie, maybe a little dreamy. So that's what I wanted to say is in comparison to this. If you look at these two, they they have similarities because they're kind of minimal, but there's so much more drama in this one just through the the contrast, the high contrast compared to this, which is much more moody and subdued. So um, let me know if you have any questions about that, about high contrast versus low contrast. Here I'm going to just show you a few other images. This one is in color, but I thought it was a really good example of this low contrast where it's all kind of, kind of if you squint your eyes at it, it all looks very gray. It all looks kind of a similar, a similar value structure. Same thing with this one, even though obviously it's a little bit higher contrast with these highlights here. And so why is this important to understand? Because when you're creating artwork, understanding how value works is really going to help you decide how you want your image to look. So if I'm wanting to create something that's a little moody, a little peaceful, then I might go towards something that has lower contrast than something that has higher contrast. There's another little thing that I wanted to point out here, though, is that just like I was saying that for babies, the first things that they see in terms of vision is high contrast um, objects, things. When you're creating artwork that is high contrast, your eye is automatically attracted to those little pieces in your image of high contrast. So often, actually, when you start when you start out drawing, a lot of people end up not realizing that just by increasing contrast, you can actually make your image a little bit more easy to read and more pleasing to the eye. So just like I'm saying, there's like a, there's like a choice that you have to make when you're drawing, like whether you're wanting to make something high contrast or low contrast, I'm actually going to invite you guys to kind of explore more of the high contrast area first, because once you understand how high contrast works and how your eye will move around an image using high contrast, then the more you can edge towards kind of lower contrast, more subtle ways of working with value. And it really, I don't know, for me personally, like, I find that it's helped me so much to work in that direction, to work first on high contrast and then to kind of edge towards lower contrast images. So that's kind of why I was thinking that it would be fun to start off with these high contrast images. And you can use the same one that I'm doing, or you can go ahead and explore your own. 
Cool, Mel. Glad you... Oh, hi, Shelly, by the way. I didn't see you sneak in. Um, good to see you. All right, so I'm going to share my screen again. Just so you can see which image I'm going to be starting off with. And I think I'm going to start off with this one because it's a very simple image. And what I'd like you to invite you to do, we're just going to be starting out with thumbnails. You know, so thumbnails are like tiny, tiny little um, rectangles. And the advantage with thumbnails is that it kind of forces you to not pay attention to complexities and just simplify. Um, and also to remember that, you know, all of this is just, it's for practice. It's for you to get better and more comfortable with value and to see how that can affect your drawings. So I'm going to start off with this one. Um, and I'm just going to pin spotlight my sketchbook so that you can see it. Can you see it? Okay. Um, why is it there? Sorry, give me a sec. I feel like there's like an annoying, you see that on the top right? There we go. That's a little better. So yeah, compared to compared to other times, actually I'm I'm just noticing like um, today is going to be really more of like a technical expert exploration, which is quite different from the other sessions that we usually do. Um, but I'm really curious to know if you enjoy it, um, if you want us to do more of these. And if you yeah, if you think it's like useful to you, because I, I love uh, things like this. I think, I mean, I can get into like little rabbit holes of it. So I'm just going to put a little bit of music on. Let me know if it's too loud or not loud enough. <clears throat> um, oh, and by the way, let me know in the chat, are you working with graphite or uh, charcoal? I think it was um, Kate who was saying that she was working with charcoal. You could be using ink as well. You could be using watercolor if you want. Um, basically, whatever sounds the most fun to you. And I just like the idea of going with graphite. Graphite is one of my one of my loves, and that I don't reach for enough. So I'm actually going to probably go towards a darker. Sorry, I just realized before before I, I launched the music. Um, would you guys like me to talk a little bit about graphite pencils and like the difference between, you know, HB, 3B, uh, 2H, or do you guys know all that stuff? If you know about it, I won't I won't spend too much time talking about it, but I can I can just give you a little bit of a rundown. Um, obviously. It's kind of like a personal preference, I'd say. <laughs> you can you can tell automatically which ones uh, I have a tendency to go for is the these darker ones, four B, six B. Um, but also since they're softer lead, they do wear out more easily than these drier ones. The one thing is that when you're using kind of softer lead it does smudge a little bit more. So then that can be, you know, a good, it can be good to have like a little spray or something like that um, to use them. But I, I guess what I wanted to say about graphite is that I remember when I was starting out, I was really scared to use like the darker ones. Um, also because they smudge more easily, but also because I had less skills. And so I would often gravitate more towards these super dry ones, um, like H to H. And because also like, if you use the H, they're kind of, uh, I'll even try my, my driest one. This is a 5H. They're very, very light. I, I don't think you can even 
see it on the video. Can, can you see it on the video? And so, um, and so, you know, when you're starting out, sometimes you get like nervous and it just like made me feel self-conscious to go towards anything darker. Um, my point is just that if that's something that you experience, like, don't worry, that's totally normal. But I'd also like to invite you to maybe try a slightly darker pencil um, so that you can just really experiment with what that's like. And of course, like, you know, these are all just exercises. They're not, uh, we're not looking for anything like finished. We're really just trying to explore um, and kind of deepen our knowledge of value. So like a 2B, if you look at that compared to the 5H, it's already much darker. If you go towards a 6B, But what you'll also notice is that because of the difference in hardness, there's a difference in the thickness of the line. So that can also be a different preference. Um, of course, if you have like a clicker pencil, then you can still have like a, you know, 4B clicker pencil, but with a thinner line than if you're using a pencil like this. The advantage with these kind of pencils is that you can, you know, you can really like go ahead and shade. So maybe before we start on the thumbnails, maybe I'll invite you to just um, pick a few different pencils or whatever it is that you're using, charcoal, et cetera, and kind of just explore the different types of marks that you can create and pay attention specifically to the value of those marks, how light and how dark it is. And maybe also even within your pencil, how light and how dark does that specific pencil go? So like if this one I'm barely pressing, I can go pretty light and then I can really go to something much darker. And if I do that with uh, my 4H, The lightness is way lighter than that. And if I press a little harder and the hardest, you can really get a sense of that difference between the two. The darkest dark of my 4H is like basically almost the lightest light of the uh, 4B or whatever it was that I was using there, the 5B. And if you're using actually if you're using something like ink. Um, then obviously, since the medium is different you're gonna have to explore it a little bit differently, but you can kind of try to do this ex exploration with water like you know your ratio of ink to water so that you go from something super light to the darkest dark and how do you have that middle kind of range. And actually, I'm curious, do you guys have like a specific type of like um, pencil weight that you prefer? Like if you or charcoal or whatever, like, do you have a preference? Um, oh, awesome, Jody. Yeah, yeah, so the 8B, which I think I almost I think I lost one. I think that's the one that I'm missing. But I really love the 8B um, as well. The only issue, of course, is as you go up, like, for example, the lightest light of your 8B is already pretty freaking dark. So, so at least for these, um, for the beginning of these uh, exercises, I'm going to ask you to go for something maybe that's in between uh, something more like a 2B or a 3B can be great. Um, I'll use my 3B, I think. All right, so if you guys feel like you've explored 
your tools enough, then we can kind of jump into the thumbnailing. And I'm actually wondering if I might not change the paper that I'm using. Because I don't know if you guys have explored with like different types of paper, but that makes a huge difference also in how your graphite lays down on the page. And personally, I actually didn't even realize that until my brother, who's a concept artist, he gifted me a sketchbook that is specifically made for graphite. And I was like, oh my God, how did I not know that this existed? Um, and if you, I don't know, if you've explored that before, then you'll know what I mean, but it's like ridiculously, it's ridiculous when you, when you try to use like actual graphite paper for the first time. So, and I'm not super psyched about this paper, even though I had, I had a memory that it was an okay thing. For Christmas, I was gifted this and I've never tried it. So maybe I'll try that one with you guys. Watch them again. Actually, I kind of like jumped into this value stuff, but um, how have you guys been like in January? Has January been crazy? I feel like it's been like the longest month. <laughs> I don't know why, but it feels like such a long month. Also, can I show you just, I got the cutest little, uh, what's it called? You know, a thing where you put your mug on it. Anyway, it's really cute. I like it. <laughs> Oh, cool, Jody. Yeah, it makes a huge difference for sure. There was actually a time where I was obsessed with mechanical pencils and I would like would only do those. Yeah, so this um, paper is made more for pencil and you can tell right away because it has like a nice structure, uh, texture, I mean, sorry. And you can kind of, I'm wondering if I can zoom in and show you that. It's really, really cool. And honestly, when I have like the right type of paper with a graphite pencil, I can literally just spend like an hour just making shades of gray so maybe one thing that we can just practice is this going from very light to very dark and having kind of a um a soft edge as in a very gradual increase in pressure to work on having a hard edge so a hard edge so you can tell that to do this first thing i'm really just um using the side of my pencil but you know obviously if you go more towards the, the tip then you're getting you know a more clear cut line than this which has more of a soft edge so maybe 
Oh, oops. You couldn't see what I was doing for you. So you can also just experiment. What if you do using the tip of your pencil? Can you also get that variation pressure that's gradual? This is kind of a cool piece. It's kind of mysterious. But yeah, I can just, honestly, I can just spend hours just doodling um, and exploring various shades of gray. It's just, I think it's, there's an, it's endlessly fascinating if you really let yourself just sink into like the sensation of it as well. And, um, you know, if you're struggling with making the texture homogenous, like, please remember that it's, it's a learning process, like, you know, it gets easier the more that you do it. And really, I think it's really fun to try to explore what is the lightest that you can go. So obviously making it really dark is easier, but making it slightly lighter is really hard. Um, all right, I got a little entranced with my graphite pencil and distracted it from this thumbnail exercise that I wanted us to do. So let's do that. But that, I mean, not to say, this is a really useful exercise, and honestly, like, you could do this every day. Like, you could just spend time exploring your graphite pencil, and you will learn so much just by doing that. Oh, hi, Christy, I didn't see you sneak in. All right, so let's get back to our image. So this is the one that we're going to start out with. Um, and I'm going to just, you can already like prep or pre-prep your little thumbnails. They don't need to be perfect. This is already going to be really interesting because, well, actually, actually, maybe you can tell me. Can you tell which of the snow or the sky is the darker of the two? I'm asking you that actually, it's not like a trick question. I'm asking you that because, um, because I genuinely am curious, because I don't, like, obviously, you know, I've been drawing for a long time and I've been training myself to see value uh, so much that I'm, I don't remember if it was very difficult for me to see, like, super light variations of uh, a hue or not. So I'm curious if it's, like, really difficult or if it's very easy for you to tell which one is darker or lighter. Okay, interesting. So yeah, the sky is definitely darker than the snow here. So you're totally right about that. So yeah, maybe it's um, 
maybe we're all just really good at seeing value, which is awesome. <laughs> um, but so what you'll notice, though, is that the difference between the two is extremely subtle, extremely, extremely subtle. So the trick here is going to be to kind of use what we practiced um, with like finding your lightest shades here and trying to apply it here. Yes, Jody, I can show you the reference. And also you have the link to the images um, so that you can have it open on the side as we're doing this. I'm going to just share it with you again. So that is the reference. Okay. All right. Cool. I mean, Christy, that's the thing is that the first step is seeing it. You know, if you start seeing, like, honestly, I feel like drawing, um, in general, drawing painting, it's um, the biggest learning is learning how to see better. And because there's so many things that our brain just like kind of erases or like considers not important. Um, and so when you're learning to draw, you're really kind of retraining your brain to pay attention to things that your brain usually just ignores. Um, so, so the first step is actually just being aware and trying to see it. And then obviously then you have the second step, which is how do you make it? <laughs> so that's what we're going to try to practice today. Um, so I'm actually going to start out with the um, snow because it's the lightest of the two and because I know that the light color of this pencil is not going to be as light as uh, the image. But so I s still want my lightest touch of my pencil to be the lightest part of the image, if that makes sense. And we're not trying to like look at the details of um, even the lightness or darkness within the snow. You could get into that, but right now we're really just trying to thumbnail, just try to gain a better understanding of how it all works. Aw, Christy, thanks so much. Yeah, exactly. Our brains are so good at like uh, pretending they know. <laughs> and then when you actually look at the thing, you're like, wait a minute. Nah, wait, that's not how it is. Um, so cool. I'm glad that I'm glad that you're like challenging yourself in that way, because it's I mean, honestly, I also feel like it really allows us to appreciate beauty and the complexity um, even more. So once you've done your, um, your snow, we're going to do the sky. And so obviously I'm going to start out with something that is very similar, but just with the slightest additional pressure. And this is going to be tricky, okay? And we're going to be able to adjust this if... Uh... So I'm just going to start with one, like, very kind of broad, light thing. And I'm just going to keep adding another light layer above it. You want to make sure you don't go too dark, but dark enough that you can at least tell that there's a difference between the two. Oh, so Christy, 
honestly, everybody has that issue. Picturing things in your mind's eye is a constant challenge. Um, and like even even me, even though I've been, you know, painting and drawing for over a decade, there's still a lot of things that I don't have like solidly in my mind's eye. And the only way that you can kind of get it in there is just by practicing. So like, let's say for example, trees, because I really love plants and stuff. I have like a, a richer kind of visual library of trees inside my mind. Um, but that's just because it's something that I'm interested in. You know, if someone was like uh, interested in cars, I don't know, they might have like a better knowledge of what a car looks like in their internal library. Um, and concept artists actually, that's what they excel at. They excel at keeping things in their mind. And it's really just about practicing. All right. So now that you've done that, we're going to just go in and start doing the darker elements. And here you want to really go the darkest that you've gone. And since it's a sum thumbnail, I'm not getting all like wrapped up in like all the complexities of the shape. It's kind of a triangle. Just do that. And then I'm just going to add, even though it's not the right scale, I'm just going to add that. Whoa, that's a cool, those are cool words. <laughs> um, all right, let's do our sec second thumbnail. Oh, there's this, this is the same one again. All right, so I'm going to just share with you the screen so that you can see which one it is. I'm going to be doing this one. Oops, that's the one we're going to be doing. Oh, and I realized that one's actually vertical, so I'm just going to make a vertical thumbnail. And again, we're not worried about perfectionism here. It's really just to just to practice. And I'm actually going to for this part, even though the whitest whites are not perfectly white, they're slightly gray, we're going to leave them white here. Yeah, totally, Wendy. That's, it sounds like it would make it a little trickier. said we're not looking for perfection here we really just want to practice
And I even decided to ignore the stairs. The point of this exercise is not faithfulness, but it's really just to get a sense of how you can create high contrast, but most of all, noticing how you perceive high, high contrast. And I'm gonna show you what I mean by that in just a second. Yeah, Christy, I mean, that sounds like a great way of going about it, for sure. quickly earlier, but I kind of wanted to just re-emphasize this, is um, our eyes are naturally going to be more attracted to high contrast areas. So, and I really want to give you a sense of this by just showing you this. And you can also do this experiment with your own um, with your own drawing. If you look at your page, we haven't done much, right? But where does your eye go first? Immediately, your eye is going to go to the place that has the highest contrast. So where you have the highest difference between your whites and your blacks. And that's just like the way that our vision works. So let's say in your image, you have something that you want to emphasize or that you want the person's eye to look at first. One way you can make sure that you're, that the viewer is going to look at that thing first is by increasing the contrast um, in that area. That means having a huger difference between the lighter part and the darker part of that section. And you can like, it's like, it's almost like a magnet. I don't know. I'm curious if you are getting a sense of what I'm talking about when you, when you look at mine, or even when you look at yours, like how your, your eye just like, even if you're trying to look somewhere else, it'll just automatically kind of come back to the high contrast area. Um, and so that's a really interesting thing to start experimenting and realizing is when you look at images, where is your eye traveling? How is it traveling? Um, and that'll allow you to kind of start understanding these little differences uh, that exist and that can really make a difference when you're creating your own pieces, if that makes sense. Oh, that makes me so happy here, Christy. I'm glad. <laughs> yeah. Anything that can make it less frustrating is awesome. Okay. Um, let's just do another one of these high contrast ones. share my screen so you can see which one we're working on. I'm actually kind of doing them in order just because it's easier that way. So this is the, the plant one. So it's like almost just the silhouette of a plant. And yeah, I kind of screwed up my thumbnails because this is also a vertical one, but that's not a big deal. So again here, we're not looking for uh, 
perfection. We're not looking for, you know, it doesn't need to look exactly like the photograph. Um, that's really not the... The goal here, the goal here is really just to explore this notion. So again, I'm going to ask you for this one to also leave the background white. So lightest light possible, the white of the page. And then we're just going to go in with our darkest darks in order to make these more plant-like shapes. And you can really like simplify it here. You know, they're kind of heart-shaped plants. So instead of making all those holes, I could also just, um, just do that. And that's good enough. And again, it's not going to be perfect, but that is not a big deal. And yeah, I mean, you know, if you look at it in detail, you can see that there's all these different, you know, there's little areas of light, for example, specifically underneath this, uh, this leaf. Um, but we're just going to ignore that for now. And we're really just going to do this two value. So one way that you can really practice, uh, working on value is doing two value studies or three value studies. Um, and while that sounds simple, it's actually, it can be, it can be really frustrating. <laughs> so that's why, like, that's why I'm starting off with these really very two value, three value kind of photographs, just so that um, we can practice doing that with something that's already kind of helping you see those two values. And for me, like the one thing that I had never understood about like value studies is that I was like, well, how do you know, like, basically you're just the one that has to pick what value you're using. Let me know if that makes sense. Oh, seeing creatures and abstract stuff, that's the best. <laughs> I love that, it's just so fun, Jody. mine and maybe we'll do one more and then we're gonna move on to a little bit more complex things I'm just gonna share this with you uh, and we're going to do this one which is kind of the opposite of the other window one that we oh no it's not actually the opposite what am i saying i just mean that like this third one has way more dark in it than it does light whereas these two have more of a balance or this one has more white so we're gonna do that one and so same thing i'm not gonna be worried about exactly what it looks like I know it's just a window, it's got a bit of this, a little bit of that, and then the rest of it is just going to be really dark. Also, I'm very curious to know if you've ever done any value studies kind of like this before. Is it something that you're familiar with or not at all? Um, And if it seems kind of, I'm mean, actually, I'm curious to know like what you're thinking of it. Like, do you, are you finding this already useful or not? And if you're not finding it useful, 
then I'd like to explain to you why it's useful. So yeah, just let me know in the in the comments. Okay, cool, awesome. Glad you're finding it useful. And actually, even though you find it useful, I'm still gonna explain <laughs> why why I find it really useful is it really helps you start to understand um, how images can work and how increasing contrast can really give a visual punch to your images. And so actually when you, um, if you look at uh, artwork of like other people that you know you like and where it's like more complex what you might want to try to look at is look at the value structure and I, I realize I didn't mention this earlier but does anyone do any of you know how to see value when you're looking either at an object or at an image um, there's like a technique that you can use in order to see it better. And I'm just curious if you know about that technique or not. Okay. All right, it's a really, really simple thing and I'm just gonna, sh I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna pinpoint my face so that you can see it. Uh, okay. So, yes, exactly, Jody. It's squinting, and it sounds like such a like weird thing. And I remember that when I, so I was, I guess I was lucky in that sense. I was told this very early on, like when I was 18 or 19. Um, but I remember like trying to squint and not like understanding. And I was like, what the hell are they talking about? But then the more that you do it, the more you do realize, yes, when you squint, when you look at something and you just like, you really just look at it with a slit, it's almost like the colors kind of fade and you just see the lights and the darks. Um, and so that's a really, really useful tool when you're trying to like, let's say, draw something that you're looking at, or even if you're looking at an image and trying to maybe analyze what you like about it and what the value structure is, that can be a really useful tool in order to kind of better see how it's working. Yeah, totally, Christy. Um, training your eyes to see shapes instead of objects. That's a very, very valuable tool as well, because it really helps you kind of boil things down. And the thing is that our brains are really made to um, capture so it's weird but it's like capture complexity and to like find patterns and so if you look at like a landscape and you want to draw it you're like oh my god there's just too much information i don't even know where to start and so the challenge that we have as visual creators is to really understand that we need to train our brains to simplify to simplify the complexity that exists out there. And so that's one way that you can absolutely do it is to train yourself to see shapes rather than objects. The other thing is to see value rather than objects. Um, and yeah, when you start like really diving into that, you get to see like how, I don't know, I feel like it's like one of these things where the more you know, the more you realize you don't know, but that's what makes it awesome, you know? Okay. So let's move on to... Um, let me share my screen with you again. Boom. We're not gonna do all of these. Um, I just put in a few different ones because I wanted you to see, uh, I wanted you to have kind of a range of different images to choose from, but also even on your own time, like after our session, you could take some 
some time to really look at each one of these images and try to understand how it's working visually. Um, this image actually right here is one that I really love and I decided to put it in here just because I wanted to show you the difference between soft edges and hard edges. Um, and I, I think I talk about this in one of my classes, the, the brush bend class, I think, if I'm not mistaken. But um, a soft edge is basically like this, where you don't really have like a defined border and where the shift between a lighter area and a darker area is kind of smooth, like a smooth transition. So you don't really have an end or a beginning, it just kind of merges into each other. Um, even here on the edge of her coat, Yes, you have a very white section and a very dark section, but the border between the two has some blurriness to it. And um, that's what I mean by like a soft edge is that sort of kind of blurry. Whoa, it's really moving a lot. Is that sort of blurry kind of sense to it and compare that with this image where you have super stark hard edges. So if you look over here, you know, there's just like a line of white and dark. Um, so it's like almost like an outline. And that's something else that you can take into account when you're thinking about value is soft edges versus hard edges. And how even if you have something that has very high contrast, you can still create a different type of mood if you're using soft edges versus hard edges. I just wanted you to kind of note it, start noticing that as well. Um, and I'm wondering if we wouldn't, that one's a little complex. I think we're going to, okay. Um, uh, Sorry, I'm just trying to figure out in what order we should do these. We could do this one. <laughs> I know you guys all love cars, don't you? <laughs> um, all right, I think we're gonna do this one actually. This one's a fun one. I actually really like this, uh, this portrait. Um, so the one with the woman with uh, glasses, sunglasses in water. Um, just one little note here. This is <laughs> what I'm doing is I'm kind of throwing you in the deep end of the pool because um, portraits, obviously people are very difficult to draw. And so I, the reason I'm like, I wanted to say this is it doesn't matter if it looks like shit. So please, please allow yourself to like, have it look like total whatever. Um, I'm going to kind of try to guide you through this one. Um, and I'll explain to you why I wanted us to work on a portrait. afterwards, if that makes sense. Okay. So anyway, are you all panicking? I'm sure you're, are you, let me know if you're panicking. <laughs> I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm just, you know, um, sometimes you just gotta jump in, you know? Oh, hey, okay, cool. You're already working on a portrait, perfect. Um, <laughs> oh, cool, Christy. I'm glad that you prefer people. That's cool. Okay. So again, we are working in a thumbnail form here. So that's why I'm also saying we don't need to panic because we're really just using this to kind of simplify. Jody, I get, I get it. I prefer, I also really love patterns too. Um, okay. So this is one of those instances and maybe I'm just going to turn off the music again, just because, um, 
this one's a little bit more complex and I don't want you guys to get like overstimulated with sound and everything. So what we were working on here before is a two value study. Now we might be going more towards a three value or four value study. I'd like you to not go for more than that. Um, actually, you know what, we're actually going to, you know what? Okay, sorry, scratch that. We're going to do a two value study on this portrait, just so you can start to see how you can break something up that's that complex into something that's much simpler. So I'm gonna ask you to like, look at this image and squint your eyes. And I really want you to start to understand like, okay, where are the lights and the darks? And maybe you can let me know in the chat what you're seeing when you squint your eyes. Do you see any sort of simplification of the values? And I'll just give you guys a moment in case you're joining along. Do you feel like the values kind of become simpler when you're squinting your eyes at this image? Maybe I'll just pop it up so that you can see it again on this. So what I'm noticing when I squint my eyes is that it's a really dark image. There's a lot of darkness. And the lightest sections that I see are her face, but also some of the reflections in the water. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to ignore the reflections in the water, even though those are the brightest points in this image, but because I just want us to really focus on the portrait itself. So what that means is, and I'm also going to be simplifying the shapes. So again, you're not looking at, you're not trying to make it uh, picture perfect realistic, you're really just trying to get a sense of what the underlying simple shape is. And if you look at her face, it's actually kind of like a an oval egg shape. So I'm just going to go ahead. It's a little smaller than that. And do that. Then we have the hand, but if you squint your eyes, the hand almost disappears. And for simplicity's sake, because I want us to really, really just focus in on, on how to simplify, we're going to also ignore that. We are going to, though, put in her neck, which is also slightly light, even though it's not as dark as the rest. Uh, you, not as dark light, light as the rest. And we're just going to go in and start creating that border. Which obviously it kind of disappears into the water so you can't actually see. Now I want you to look at her face again and I want you to tell me what the darkest, what's the darkest part that you can see on here. Yes, exactly, Christy. The glasses are the darkest thing that you can see here. And the funny thing is actually, 
it merges with the darkness behind it. Yes, there are lines. You can see those really bright. Oh, I'm gonna just share on the screen so you can see it. The glasses are really just as dark as this background. And you do have like these two kind of reflective light things and another one here. So you could, if you wanted to for this two value thing, you could include those. Um, but I'm actually just going to even just erase that information and then maybe we can do that if we do like a three value one or whatever because I really just want you to show show you that you can really just take an image and simplify it. So there are these glasses. Oh, stop sharing that and the other glasses which are there and then you just have the connector and then yes you don't really see it because there's the hand there instead but that's what you see and then i could add just the nose and the lips And this is literally just two values. And actually, you know what? I'm going to kind of cut it off here because that's where the water is. So we're only going to see. which to be fair might look a little strange, almost as though she doesn't have another uh, shoulder. But that's the thing is when you do two value studies, then you have to make simplifications. And so this is the, the thing that I wanted you to understand with value studies. You're the one that gets to choose what information you put in and what information you take out. And that's the case for any study that you do of anything, whether it's a value study, a color study, a composition study, you're the one that's in charge of making those choices. So I used to think that um, like, oh, there's a right way to do a value study and there's a wrong way to do a value study. There's like, you know, you have to get it exactly the right hue. Um, and honestly, that's, like that can be a goal if you want to make it like picture perfect realistic but no what you're doing is you're making those decisions and in making those decisions you're going to be learning stuff about how the image works and how you're translating the image and what it is that you find important in your image making so i hope that makes sense so this is our two value study of this face and okay now i want to to do another little experiment. So you can look at your thumbnails that you've done. I'm gonna show you mine. Sorry, I hope that doesn't make you feel sick. Um, oh no, that's not straight on. Cool, Christy, Tim Burton is awesome. He's super inspiring, so I like that. Oh, I'm struggling to make this flat. I don't know. All right. So you can look at your uh, your different images. Um, oh my god, I'm just realizing, does my phone have like a weird shape? Whoa. It's not like 16.9, that's strange. Anyway. Um, okay, you can look either at your thumbnails that you made or at mine, and I want you to try to notice where is it that your eyes are going to first. And if you can let me know in the chat, that would be awesome. I'm actually, sorry, I'm going to zone, zone in a little bit more. 
There we go. Just in these four. I want you to look just at these four. Oh, interesting, Christy. Okay. Anyone else? Cool, Jody. Yeah, I'd love to see a few more of your answers if you have any. Oops. All right. Well, when I look at these, the one that I immediately see first is her face. You're right, um, who was it? Was it Christy? The window is also competing with it, and the reason is actually because the face and the window are the same size. Um, but there's two things at play. Obviously, there's a huge difference between the black and the white. But that's not the reason that we're looking at this. The reason that we look more at the face is because as human beings, we're attracted to human beings. <laughs> in the sense of like that's like the first and most important piece of information that your brain is going to decode from an environment like oh is there another human being around so even when you have things that have the same value so you have like multiple values here right uh, sorry like multiple two value studies they have the same values, this, 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 but yet there's still going to be a hierarchy in terms of how you're going to look at them. And often we're going to first go towards people or something recognizable like a window or a plant. And then afterwards is going to come the more abstract things. So. I don't know, I just think like th that's something that I learned in uh, Nathan Fauk's composition class on schoolism.com, which if you want to do a deep dive on composition, I highly recommend it, even though it's like super hardcore and like <laughs> it takes it takes a lot of time to like go through it all. But um, I thought it was fascinating when I realized this and it just made it um, it's just interesting to pay attention to that because it allows you to really like understand how images work way more than before. Like, why is it that I'm looking at this? Why is it that this is the thing that my eye goes to first? Yeah, Pam, you're right. And so because of the reflection too, this one also looks darker, you're right. And no, Christy, I mean, <laughs> I don't think it's that you hate people. I just, I agree with you that they're competing because these two are the most recognizable elements in between all of these. Like, we know that that's a window and we know that that's a face. Do you know what I mean? So even though these are windows, but like this looks way more like a window than this one does. All right. Um, let's move on. I'm hoping you're not sick of me like chatting because I've been chatting a lot today. Uh, the artist that teaches composition is Nathan Fawkes. He's a really funny guy. The way he talks is just hilarious. Um, he's a very, uh, I'll just do that. He's a, he's a very um, quirky guy uh, who like, I guess he's been teaching for a long time. So he just has this like whole like way of teaching that's just like really quirky, sometimes almost annoying, but also really endearing. Uh, so he's a funny mix. He's the, it's the kind of thing I think you, you, you like it or you hate it kind of thing. Um, anyway, but he's like a crazy talented um, concept artist. And I should say skilled because I don't like the word talent, but you know what I mean. Uh, and he just has like this in-depth understanding of how images work. And I learned so much in taking his classes. So yeah, if you're interested in really, really deep diving, then that's like one way to go about it. Um, though what he does, he does more digital stuff. So it's less uh, analog, even though he does have a course, I think, on uh watercolor and gouache but it's 
he doesn't use it in a way that I would say um, is like the traditional watercolor way of using it. Anyway, that aside, let's continue on our exploration of value. Um, Would you like to do like a three or four value study of this face, or do you guys want to move on to something else? Oh, hi, Maite. I didn't see you sneak in. There's so many people sneaking in today. I love it. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, there's another one. Katya, I didn't see you sneak in either. Oh, I love it. It's great. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, all right, then let's do a three value study. Okay, so there's one vote for doing a three value study and another one for moving on. So <laughs> I need someone else to give me another vote so I should know which, uh, which to do. We could move on to a different portrait, too. That could be interesting. Move on. OK. All right. Sorry who like I don't remember who was the voted for staying on, <laughs> but we can we're going to move on for this one. Um, we can either do this one or that one. I also really like this, and I think this will actually be a very good illustration of a three value study because it's a very, very clear. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but for me, like I can immediately see the three values. Um, and I actually I'd be interested in knowing if you see them easily, because again it's something that is very tricky our brains aren't used to parsing information in that way, so it's really something that you need to train, but this one is slightly easier to see than the other one. Okay awesome so why don't we do that, since we haven't done any three value studies and then we can try something a little bit more complex after that. Oh, and I'm going to stop sharing. Move on to this. Boom. Right. It's like almost all of these photos are vertical. I just didn't realize that initially. Okay, so this is really simple. Um, because of the blurriness, it kind of also, I think, helps us see the simple shapes that are underlying the image. If you didn't have that blurriness, you'd like get distracted by like, oh, how does the shirt go? Like, how does her arm and the shirt connect with the chest and the waist and blah, blah. But the blurriness kind of really helps you see yeah, the simplicity of those shapes. So first of all, one thing that I notice is that there's this big shape kind of here. Then there's the simple shape of her shirt. Just like that. And then her face. Which is like that. Oh, and I didn't, I should have actually, I'm just going to extend this. In general, for value studies, I think it's a good idea to not use your eraser too much, just because you learn a lot when you don't do that. But in this case, I just didn't place it right or didn't use the right proportion. So you can, of course, go ahead and use that there. And so that's pretty simple. So I'm going to just start with my darkest darks.
And just in order to separate her face from the background, I'm just going to add a little thing of light. And that's what I mean also by you choosing what information you put in and take out. Sometimes, like, for example, in this case, her hair and the background object that it's on are actually almost the exact same color. And there's a very, very faint line of light on the edge of her hair that kind of, um, you know, allows you to see it. But... I'm not staying that faithful to the image in this case because I still want it to be readable that it's a person. And then honestly for this rest of the stuff so i'm gonna put just the dark here under her feet because it grounds her a little bit and i'm just gonna use this middle mid gray If I really wanted to be a perfectionist about it, I would not have done it horizontally because with graphite you can really tell the difference between horizontal and vertical strokes. So if you're want to, wanting to create something homogenous, it's better to keep the same direction of your stroke. How was that one for you guys? Are you starting to see like the three values in that one? Awesome. Okay. Um, and actually, you know, something that I did here is you see the third value that I used is actually much darker than in the image. So if I had wanted to be a little bit more precise, I could have gone for something that was more like this or slightly darker than that. But I don't mind um, because I just think it's really interesting to have this person. And so by making this mid-tone a little darker and making it closer to this black, it's really making the character kind of pop out of the image more. Yeah, exactly, Pam. So blurry images are really useful for that. Um, and it's good to practice. And then what you can start doing is that when you're looking at something that's not blurry, to try to just practice see, getting to that simple shape. What is the simple shape that's underlying it? How can I ignore all the details that my brain is trying to latch onto and really focus on what's important. Exactly, so Maite, that's exactly, um, yeah, that's exactly what I mean. When like our, our brains are really made to focus on details. It's just like, you know, and if, uh, who was it that made this analogy? Maybe it was Nathan Fox in his course, I don't remember. Um, that basically, if you think about it, humans initially they're like, you know, hunter gatherers. And so like you have to like go around and be able to look at stuff and like find the berries on the bush and be able to differentiate between all the crazy leaves and the blueberry that's like almost the same color as the other leaves around it, you know? So the point is just that like that is how our brains work. And so we really need to train it to do something that is very unnatural for it. So if you struggle with that, it's absolutely normal. It's, it's like the most normal thing to just be caught up in the details. 
And like, I still sometimes do that where I'm like, oh yeah, but wait, there's like a slight little shade over here. And then I'm like, wait, 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 wait. snap out of it, take a step back. What is it that I'm focusing on? Like, is that detail important for the image? And sometimes, yeah, sometimes you do want to like dive in and like get super like intricate and work on these tiny little details that are going to be part of the image. But if you're able to balance that out with understanding the, the power in simplicity and the power in simplification and in seeing shapes, very simple, clear shapes, simple, clear um, forms, simple, clear shadows and light, it's going to like help your drawing and your painting so, so much. Um, so, okay, another thing that I wanted to say, Maite, is that you were correct. Her face is actually the third value. Um, but can you guess why I decided not to do that and why I decided to change it? Maybe I could even show you. I'm going to show you. Uh, Okay, so I decided to make the face light colored. Yes, exactly, Maite. It's so that her body stays one. It's so that you recognize that she's a character. So even though it wouldn't, it doesn't match exactly the photo, if I decided to keep the face a darker value, look at what happens. It's like she doesn't have a head, <laughs> which is, uh, yep, she disappears. And so that's one of those instances where I, as, um, as a, an artist who's looking at something, have to make a decision about what it is that I'm keeping and what I'm changing in order to keep my image clear. And I, since I have a lot of practice, I know that if I keep it the same value, it's going to just disappear and you won't be able to recognize it as a character. When you're looking at a photo, you have a lot more information and so your brain is better able to parse um, that that's a human being and not like a headless body. <laughs> but when you're translating like a photograph into um, a drawing, you don't have as much information so you have to kind of let your you just have to kind of remember how it is that your brain works and kind of experiment and see you know like maybe it would be fun maybe i could be like oh i just want to make a bunch of headless you know uh characters and that would be fine as well right my point is just that we're the ones that make the decisions um and Sorry, I'm just going to replace my spotlight just so I can. We're the ones that make the decisions. And, okay, how can I put this? Um, I talk about this in one of my classes. Art, fundamentally, is all about choice. It's all about choices that we make, whether they're deliberate or intuitive. Um, and so... A lot of the work that I've done over the past decade has been following my intuitive choices. And I think there's so much beauty in letting your intuition guide the way. But it's also important to understand that even when you're letting your intuition lead, you're still always making choices. And sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to kind of convey this, but it's like, okay, when I, and I don't remember who it was that mentioned this to me at first, it might have been my brother um, that art is about choices. I don't remember who it was. When I kind of heard that, it kind of made me panic. Uh, and I don't know if you can relate to that, like if you, if you get a sense of like, 
as I say that, you're like, wait, if it's about choices, then shit. If it's like not, if it doesn't look good, it's that I didn't make the right choice or something. Um, I remember that at some point, well, when I heard that, I started like kind of worrying every time I would end up in front of a page and being like, oh, well, what choice am I making today? Like, as though it's like a final thing. And my point is, I don't want you to get hung up on that idea of choices, but it's still a very valuable thing to note that it is about choices. And so you're the one who has the power to modify an image in order to bring it closer to something that you'd like or not. Yeah, the, yeah, exactly. Choices feel overwhelming sometimes. Wait, is it just me or am I not in focus? I almost feel like I'm like not in focus, even though I like did the focus earlier. Uh, I hope it's okay. Yeah, so choices feel overwhelming. And that's why I'm saying, I'm, take, I'm telling you this, but take it with a grain of salt. Even if you consider that, it do, that doesn't mean that you need to make conscious choices all the time. But just keep that kind of in, like in the background so that like when you're exploring something or when you realize that something's not working in your image, you can kind of bring that up to the forefront and being like, okay, well, what are the choices that I made, whether consciously or intuitively that led me to this? And then you can start saying like, oh, well, this choice that I made of using this color, maybe that was not the right choice, but I don't mean it in like a, like a, like a, oh, I'm like, it was a stupid choice, but more like, I can now choose to do something different next time. I guess what I'm trying to say is, and I'm sorry, I'm finding it very difficult to convey this. Um, you can, if you, if you integrate that no, notion of choice kind of loosely, it gives you more power to understand why it is that you don't like an image or why it is that you do like an image. And how can you modify those choices and experiment within those choices and um, explore and fail and succeed? You know what? I'll, like just yeah, I don't know. I hope I've I hope I've kind of explained that. I feel like that was really convoluted, but um, exactly, Pam. There's no wrong choices. Exactly. There's choices. You're always making choices all the time but none of them are wrong. It's just information. And when you know that, then you can, you can shift it. You can try something else out. Okay. Let's get back to our drawing. Oh, for sure, Maite. Like, the amount of decisions that I have delegated to my intuition over the past decade has been like <laughs> ridiculously high. Um, and I think it's it's cool, it's fun. It lowers the pressure. Uh, then at some point you get to a point where you're like, yeah, but what if I wanna make it something else? Um, and that's when, you know, learning about how images work can really be helpful. All right. So let me know if there's an image that you'd like to work on more than any other. I'm just kind of going to go through these. I think this one could be interesting um, just because of the very low variation. The tree in the field. Do you mean the first one? Do you mean this one? Ooh, the birdies. After the lamppost. 
Oh yeah, you're right, because I added a bunch of images right at the end that I'd forgotten about. Oh yeah, this tree is totally beautiful. Um, and then the birdies are also really fun. Oh no, wait, where, where are we? I got lost. The birdies are cute. Maybe we could do the birdies. I think it would be fun to do like a lower value thing. And, um, I'm just trying to remember because I think there was something else that I wanted to mention. I'm just kind of juggling internally with how much I'm going to give you today because I feel like I've already given you a lot so I don't want to overwhelm you <laughs> it's like like I said it's a subject that I'm really passionate about so there's like a lot that we could keep exploring um but why don't we yeah why don't we try these birdies and then we'll do the tree after that or no, you know what? We're going to do the tree first, and then we're going to do the, the birds. So this one is actually quite simple. It's in its value structure. Um, it's got some nice big dark darks, and then some lighter mid-tone grays. So this would be more of a you know, two value study, but you could add a third value by adding like the the clouds and like seeing that there's some slighter, lighter bits in here. So we can try to do that. And what's actually interesting if we are using two values for the sky um, is that that'll kind of force you to work on soft edges and trying to, um, yeah, really kind of have that gradual, that gradual, um, what's the word? The gradual mix, the gradual, there's a word, you know what I mean. <laughs> so we're going to do that. Actually, I just realized uh, I started immediately going in with the tree, but I'm going to actually do the sky first, and I'd recommend that you do the sky before the tree. So I'm just going to try to go in with a very, very light Also, I didn't mention that, but sometimes you can use like an eraser as a way to like kind of look for third value by kind of taking away pigment. And that's kind of actually what I might do here for the lighter sections of the I 
actually, I could go add a fourth value by just adding a slightly darker section. And then with these lighter ones. I find it really annoying that my, it's like my, this happened the last time. And my iPad kind of turns off after every song on Epidemic Sound. Oh, wow. bogged down in too many details because again this is just these are just thumbnails for us to practice seeing value and creating value so you really don't need to get caught up in too many details and actually what I noticed is I made my tree way bigger than the one in the photo whatever it's again it's not a big deal Thank you so much for joining. Yay! And you can always catch the replay. Uh, I'm going to be uploading it in the next 24 to 48 hours. So you can always catch up then as well. So now we're going to move on to the birdies, which are also cute. And I feel bad because they look really cold. But it's going to be an interesting image because, well, maybe I can test you guys. Would you say it's low contrast or high contrast? Maybe that's too easy, too easy of a question. <laughs> um, yeah, so again, we're going to go for a thumbnail here. Nothing. Yes, Katya, exactly. Awesome. Low contrast. So there's not a huge range. The range is pretty, pretty tight. Um, and that's what gives it also that moody quality. So I'm just going to go in and do another thumbnail over here. Hopefully you guys are seeing. Yeah, okay. More of a square. And so in terms of decision making, this is one of those things where um, you kind of have to make a difficult decision. I'm going to tell you what my decision is going to be for this. You don't need to make the same decision. 
but because it's so low contrast so you you don't even have any blacks at all it's literally just white and gray you could just decide your white is going to be like you know a very like low um low pressure graphite thing or the decision that i'm going to make which is the the white is just going to be the white of the paper and so then what i want to make sure is just that my grays my like darkest colors are not as dark as like let's say this you know i want my darkest grays to be actually much more discreet and that's going to be able to like that's going to allow you to mimic this kind of low contrast image um there's a bunch of birds here so i'm actually not going to recommend that you do all of them because otherwise it would take us like you know 20 minutes to do all of them <laughs> but you can do just a few um and then you can add some more um if you want afterwards but so i'm gonna pick some of the ones that i like the most i really like this guy on the left and so since this is low contrast i'm hoping you're gonna be able to see it um it might be more difficult to see Thing that you're gonna have to make a decision on is what are you gonna do about the body and I'm gonna I'm gonna actually try to do two things I'm gonna do this little guy I like him it's a cool tune. the ones that have like the legs that are kind of like splayed out it's really cute with the knobby knees too i didn't really do knobby knees on the other ones but maybe i will no, just add a little So the thing that's tough when you're working with low contrast is like resisting adding too much pressure. And I gotta say, since we're working with something that's so small, that also makes it tough. But um, you're gonna see already that there's a challenge because do you leave the bodies completely white or, and I think it works for some of them like this one, the one that's in the middle here it works even without the outline because you can see it but for this one who's completely white it doesn't work and so then i have to make a decision even though it's almost the same color as the background i'm going to go ahead and add an outline 
because otherwise it makes my image unreadable. And I might go in back for this one too because I think he needs a little bit more definition here. how many of them you're gonna put I kind of like the ones that are on the edge here I think it's kind of cute that they're like falling out of the image almost so I'm just gonna add one and then I'm gonna add his little buddy and he has a bit of a like legs coming in which is kind of funny and cute And I think I'm okay already with that many, but I could go in if I wanted to and make more of them. But even compared to the image, I feel like there's a few little spots where I went a little too dark. And that's always the tricky thing with low contrast images, if they're on the light end of the spectrum. Just because, again, it's harder to make low pressure strokes than it is to like really go hardcore into strong um, value. So for the next one, and then I think after this next one, we're just gonna kind of let go of these references and just play a little. But I did want you to try this one because this is also a low contrast image but on the darker end um, whereas the birds were on the lighter end um, very restricted values on the light side this is a very restricted value spectrum on the dark side and I thought that would be an interesting one to explore And I'm reading, um, not reading, I'm realizing, oh, hey Pam, no worries, thank you so much for joining. And yeah, um, it's true, I forgot to mention this for anyone who left, but uh, if you want to go ahead and share, you can share in the Discord channel. I'd love to see what you did, what you experimented with, even if it was something completely different um, than what I worked on today. And you can of course use the Moon Moss Club Hashtag if you're sharing on Instagram. Aw, oh, Katya, I'm so glad that you enjoyed it. Thank you so much, you guys. We're not going to stay on very long. For those of you who are still here, we have about another 25 minutes to wrap up. So if you have any other questions about value or if you want to also come off mute and just have a chat, that's also an option. I know usually I open it up a little bit earlier. Um, but yeah today was a little later it's today was jam-packed today was jam-packed with value stuff so <laughs> um no worries shelly thank you so much for joining and we'll just do this last one And 
and I can't wait to see you all next month. All right, I'm gonna make a smaller one here. And what I'm gonna actually do is I'm gonna already outline my lighter areas. going in with my darks. And there's also a bit of a light thing over here. I'm not going to bother too much with that. I'm kind of going to ignore, there's like a tiny little element that looks like a, I don't know, almost as though there's like a little mini table or something on the right. And I'm going to ignore that because I don't care so much about that element in this image. Um, and that also kind of gives you an idea of like, you know, you are free to make the decisions that you want for the drawings that you're making. If you find that an interesting element, please go ahead and put it in. And so you'll, what you'll notice here is that right now I'm doing almost a two value study where it's just black and white. But what I might go in and do afterwards is in the light sections, I might actually add just a tiny bit of um, very low pressure graphite just so that I can get back to something that's slightly lower contrast. But if it intrudes too much with the readability of it, then I might not, then I might backtrack and like take that away. So that's what I mean. You just have to experiment and kind of see what works. Aw, Christy, thank you. That makes me so happy to hear. Glad you're enjoying it. I'm also thoroughly enjoying it. And also apologies for when we started out. I felt like I was a bit of a whirlwind there. <laughs> but get through just days like that. Art and a cup of coffee, life is good. Could not agree more with that statement. <laughs>
Yeah, and I like 4 p.m. too because it seems like it's maybe like a good time for people who both live in the U.S. and who uh, live in Europe. I mean, I've tried like opening it up to other times as well, you know, as you've seen in the polls. Um, but it just seems like consistently to be the time that works best for most people, so. All right, so now that I have ba my basic uh, two-tone image already, I know this is way too dark, uh, way too bright, I mean, for what it is in the image. So I'm just gonna go ahead and darken that a little bit. This one I'm going to darken a little less. And then this stuff, I'm going to darken it, but very, very slightly. And one of the other things that I wanted you to note about value is that, like, our, our minds are actually really good at picking up subtlety, like, way more than we think they are. So... You can note already those differences. And even though this is good, that my readability is pretty good here, I'm still going to darken it a little bit so I can get more of that low contrast feel of the initial image. But I want to do it very gradually so that I can kind of see. Still going even darker, but I'm still able to read the image. So that's what I mean by we're, our brains are actually really good at picking up subtleties. Um, sometimes you can push it further than you think, which is kind of the opposite of what I said here about the face. Um, but that's the reason for that, and I'm going to explain that right now actually, is that in this you have very low contrast. So when you have low contrast, that means that, you know, if you're looking at just that, you can pick up on the subtle variations the of the lightness. When you're working with higher contrast images, so where you have more um, differences between the lights and the darks, it means that you're going to lose some of the subtleties within the midtones. So that's why in this image, I had to kind of make that much lighter in order for it to pop out. If I was in a low contrast scenario with this, like let's say that her shirt is almost the same color as the background, since there's no very, very extreme whites, then I would be able to still create a better variation, a better, um, like more readability around her face, even if it's not pure white. I hope that makes sense. Oh, cool, Christy. Yeah, totally. I, I like to alternate between, uh, you know, working with more of the darks or the lights. It really depends on my mood. Um, you know, sometimes in some classes, you'll like see people, they say, oh, you have to always start with the darks or you always have to start with the lights. And honestly, it's more just like what seems to make the most sense for you. Um, obviously, there are kind of differences if you're working on certain mediums, there are some mediums where you have to work from light to dark or dark to light, kind of. But I would always take that like with a grain of salt, the have do's and the shoulds, you know? So yeah, I'm pretty happy with this. And I'm actually realizing in the photograph that the lightest parts are kind of in the center. So I'm just gonna darken these trees that are kind of on the edge. And you're gonna notice that you can still see them because of the fact that it's a low contrast drawing. And that's why I really wanted us to explore that. It's, it's more difficult to do that when you're on the light end of the low contrast, just because, um, well, especially with the 2B pencil, <laughs> I was going to say, because it's automatically darker. Uh, yeah, thanks, Christy. It's it's really important to me because um, as a recovering perfectionist, um, you know, I would often get hung up on this idea of right or wrong. Um, 
and really it's very very arbitrary like right and wrong is just it's like it's just a non it's not a thing but we've convinced ourselves that it's a thing <laughs> so i try to like kind of show that it's not a thing I'm going to also darken his center bits a little bit. So that, that kind of falls into the background. And what we mostly see is those trees. So I'm pretty happy with this one now. Darken this a little bit more. Yeah, that's true, Jody. I'm I'm always into rule breaking too. And then yes, it's true. Then you realize like actually some rules can be good to to learn, <laughs> so that you can also know how to better break them, right? Um, totally. I think a lot of us honestly are recovering perfectionists. I think it's a very very common thing. All right, so. Maybe for this last one, we're going to just move away from the references. And what I'd like you to do is I'd like to pick whether you're going to work with high contrast, something more like this, or low contrast, something more like this. And I want you to pick one of those two things, and we're going to make an abstract exploration um, of either high contrast or low contrast, depending on what you chose. And so again, we're not worrying too much about composition. Like, like I don't care what it looks like. I just want you to really um, start exploring maybe with different shapes and lines. You can maybe, if it's easier, you know, make some outlines or you can just go ahead and just start creating shapes. on your own. Yeah, exactly, Melanie. Low contrast is always harder. And that's, again, coming back to that principle of it's because of the added complexity. When you're working with high contrast, then it's much simpler to really see like the forms, etc. And when you start going into low contrast, you really need to um, work with subtlety. And that's why I often say that it's a good thing to kind of work from something that's really easier and then just increase complexity little by little. But then again, you know, I could just suddenly become obsessed with like, oh, I really like low contrast dark images and I just I'm going to explore that. And then you'll learn a ton just by doing that. You know what I mean? So like, as I say, like, it's good to go from simple to complex. That's also not true. And it's also more about what it is that you're interested in working on. Um, I'm just trying to give you kind of like a guideline in case you want to kind of little by little increase complexity, but you could immediately start out with the complex thing. And I guarantee that even if you do that, you're going to learn so much if you just keep at it. Yeah, exactly, Christy. Low contrast is moodiness, dreaminess, kind of creepiness too sometimes. Um, but it can be fun. And of course, you know, like I'm giving you kind of like the extremes between, you know, this is the highest contrast and then the very, very low contrast, but you have these middle ranges which have a bigger range of values. Oh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> a bigger range of values. So you could also decide to explore something more in that realm if you want. And I don't know yet if I'm going to do a high contrast or low contrast, so I decided to actually just start with this mid gray. 
um, you can just kind of go from there. So actually, you know what, I'm going to try to do a very low contrast um, image here. But you know how this was like more in the very light lights, I'm going to make it a little bit more mids because I have this mid gray. So I'm just going to pick a few things to make slightly darker. Then I also want to work very light. Again, don't worry about what it looks like, like the composition or whatever. I just want you to really just explore um, the different values that you can get, whether you're working with low contrast or high contrast or something in between. So I'm making it all kind of this homogenous kind of lighter thing. But then so you can already see since I made everything more of that same value then this darker streak is really popping out way more which is that same principle that i was kind of trying to tell you about with the face so basically anything that i make slightly darker is really going to pop out more since we have such a restricted um value scheme Of course, just because I can't resist, I want to put a window in here. So, if I wanted to, I could go in and just add a little bit of highlight, maybe with my eraser. And that's going to really pop out. And actually, just for the fun of it, I'm just going to show you how you can like, you know, I'm taking a low contrast image here. Um, and I'm actually going to change it up and make it a higher contrast image. So what I'm going to do, this is literally, this is just like, you know, that's what I mean by experimenting and exploring. Like it's not because you've made a decision once that that means that you're stuck to it and you can, you know, use it as an opportunity to learn. Um, like this is all a very low contrast image. Okay, now I want to turn it into a high contrast image. How do I do that? Well, since I've already like explored a lot of these like lighter values, what I have to do is go in and go dark. And you'll notice how it immediately transforms the image and its readability, where it is that your eye goes to. And because suddenly this is much darker, the subtleties over here they all kind of melt into each other. Um, so 
that means that if I want other parts of my image to really stand out, well, I need to maybe increase the contrast in those areas. So that's like a fun thing to do is like, um, yeah, kind of experiment with switching it from one to the other. And so, okay, so like, I'm gonna take the same some thumbnail. I'm gonna invite you to, I hope you've been doing this along with me, or if not, that you, you can do this afterwards because it's a really fun exercise. And it's funny, I'd never thought of doing it in one, but I really, really like that. I think it's a, uh, a very interesting exercise. So now we have something that's a little bit more high contrast with a bigger range between my darkest darks and my lightest lights. What if now I want to make it low contrast again? Well, so that means that I'm going to be edging more towards the darks again. So everything that's light, I'm going to darken it up again. But then more than that, I need to bring all of these mid-tone grays to something slightly darker. So what I can start to do is do something just really homogenous. And already, you've noticed that I've lost all the subtlety that I used to have, even though I've literally just applied the color all um, all in one sheet, <laughs> like one like homogenous thing, I had a lot of variation and that variation was lost. So that's an interesting thing to know. So, okay, I'm still, I'm getting lower contrast, but what if I wanna lower it even more? Then I'm gonna go in and increase the darkness of some of these areas again. Yeah. Christy, I'm really, it's funny that I'd never thought of, I'm, I'm really happy that this kind of showed up during our session of like taking one image and working through low contrast and high contrast within a single image. I think that's really, really an interesting way of going about it. Um, so I'm glad that you're enjoying that because I think it's, yeah, I think there's something there. And so I might go in and I'm gonna also darken a little bit more. And so now since I'm darkening a bit more and I'm losing some of that contrast, I'm going towards a lower contrast, I'm now seeing the subtleties appear again. The subtleties are more prominent again. So you can see just these the very slight variations in dark just become very important. And then if I wanted to go even darker than I could, I could go to something even darker. And as I do that, there would still be even more subtlety that I would be able to pick up in those variations. Like I'm entering this world, it's almost like, you know, it reminds me of 
when you go outside and you look at the stars and at the beginning you don't see anything and then your eyes get used to the darkness and you start seeing all the details emerge so it's kind of that similar principle um and then let's say i have this i mean i could go even darker you know if i wanted to and what if i wanted to create higher contrast suddenly I could go in and take off a huge amount of that pigment. And then I'm back into high contrast land. But of course, sometimes there's a limit because sometimes your eraser, I mean, it's not perfectly white. It won't, I won't be able to get the, the white white that I had there. So yeah, I hope you were able to kind of explore that in your own little exploratory thumbnail. Um, it kind of would have been fun to take a photograph of how it started and all the different phases. Um, so you could do that, for example, you know, on your own time in another exercise, just decide to take an image and kind of take photos and then you can kind of see the progression and how you move from from one section to another, from a high contrast to low contrast, to a higher contrast to lower contrast. And you can really kind of explore that entire range of, um, yeah. This is cool, thanks you guys. I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of fun. Um, I am going to just switch it up here. Oh, sorry, that light is very, very bright. We'll do that. It's pretty dark now. Um, oh, yay, I'm so glad that you that you enjoyed it. And it does look like I'm, I'm blurry. Even though I had done the... I am so sorry, you guys. Wait, where's my face? There's my face. Okay, and now any bet I'm not going to be able to make it like zoom out again. Okay, well now I'm just, you know, I'll <laughs> just be in this little square. Um, yeah, I don't mean, how come it's not going back? Oh God. <laughs> I'm like, shoot, wait, what did I do? Okay, maybe I'll just turn this off and I'll turn it back on again. Okay, can you hear me? Um, hopefully you can hear me. Thank you so much, Melanie, for suggesting that we work on value. I thought it was really fun. And um, again, it's just one of these subjects that I think is endlessly fascinating. And most of all, it's just so, so valuable. Ha ha ha, value is valuable, ha ha. Um, yeah, now I'm, no, I'm bringing out my bad jokes apologies um but it is it really is if you if you want to work on your visual language on making stronger images uh value is one of the most important subjects that you can dive into um i think at the beginning of my color collector class i had this quote about how um darn it i wish i had written it down for today i should have written it down something about like how basically value is literally the most important thing in your images and color is the thing that comes afterwards. And that's absolutely true because when you can start looking at colors and seeing past the color to see the value of it and use that as a building block for your image, then you start to really, really have like a rich playground to play with. Um, <laughs> thanks for enjoying my bad joke. <laughs> Yep. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining. Um, and for those of you who are watching on replay, I'd love to see how you kind of went about this exercise, um, what you learned, um, the little like thumbnails. And also, I'd love to see if you did the final little abstract thumbnail. I'd love to see what you made with that. So, of course, you can share it in the Discord channel or on Instagram. 
Um, and yeah, I think that for next month, I'm not sure what we're going to be like working on, but if there is a subject that you're uh, specifically more interested in exploring, we could even continue exploring value, but in a different way too, um, or some other subject, then yeah, please let me know. And uh, yeah, it was really lovely to see you all. And yeah, this time there wasn't much chatting, I guess, um, other than, you know, uh, me, <laughs> but uh, that's okay. Uh, sometimes, sometimes it's more about, you know, the principles and stuff that you can learn and apply and inject into your artwork. I hope you have a lovely evening, peeps. And I will definitely see you soon. I'm going to send out the poll for next month's live session next week. Um, I know it was a little later this month, just because like, you know, the return from holidays and all that. Uh, but I'm going to get back to sending it at the beginning of the month so that we can schedule it ahead, like well in advance. Um, so that you can make sure that you can come. And if it is blurry, which I feel like this video has been blurry the whole time, I'm so sorry, and I'm definitely going to do better next time. <laughs> Apologies. All right. Have a good night, everybody.